Hello everybody, this week I have been living with the Mazda MX-30 REV and I have to say I've been looking forward to it for quite some time because this is another car that demonstrates Mazda's ability to think outside the box when it comes to their new cars. Where other manufacturers appear almost determined to come out with a set of new vehicles that are increasingly similar and hard to tell apart, Mazda has been employing some genuinely bold thinking. Most recently, I drove the CX-60, a car with a newly developed 3.3-litre turbo diesel engine, because Mazda believe there is still a lot in the black fuel yet. And before that, I drove the arguably even more innovative Mazda 3, complete with a 2-litre engine that, thanks to some very clever technology, delivered almost diesel-like economy from a petrol. Today though, it's the turn of this, the MX-30. And here we have a car that on paper appears to be one that I think could have the ability to lure just about anybody into what might be their first EV. And I was very ready to shout from the rooftops and tell all of you just how great it was and how you all needed to rush out and buy one right away. Unfortunately, not only is this a car that I cannot give my full recommendation, it is in fact one so flawed, I'm really not sure why Mazda bothered to even sell it at all. Why is that? Well, find out in today's episode of JM on Cars. <laughs> So then, before we get onto this car's massive and potentially deal-breaking Achilles heel, let's first talk about what exactly the MX-30 is and a few of the things it does right. First off, what is the car? Well, it is a compact crossover SUV, I believe currently the smallest in the Mazda lineup. It's certainly not a bad looking thing, although nowhere near as pretty as the Mazda 3, and it has some of the same slab-sided design as the last Mazda 4x4 that I drove. It isn't pretty, but neither, I would say, is it particularly ugly. It also has some rather nice design touches. The lights, front and rear, are very pretty. It has the typical Mazda pulsating indicators. This sole crystal red paintwork with contrast black roof is beautiful as ever, and overall I think it's a fairly pleasing thing to the eye. There's also a nice nod to the old RX-8 in the form of these doors, which at the front open conventionally, though I will say impressively wide, going essentially to 90 degrees. But at the back, it has what you'd call a suicide arrangement. In other words, they open the other way, giving you a very large aperture, allowing excellent access to the cabin, which itself also feels generally fairly high quality. Though there isn't quite as much leather as I would like, there's still quite a bit of it, and the uh, other materials are of a mixed nature, they're not hideous, although I'm really not keen to see cork making a comeback. Of all the old car materials that should have stayed in the past, cork is definitely one. There is also plenty of storage throughout, you've got a glove box over here, you've got plenty of space in the door bins, you've even got storage under the centre console here and where you'd expect it, a little cubby hole in the middle. There's a pair of cup holders in the centre too and the interior features a number of nice little touches that I've seen in many other Mazda products, including the fact that your main infotainment system up here is all controlled by a physical setup down here, which is lovely. The dash then is nice, clear, easy to read. You have a pair of analog dials, one on each side of a central digital screen, and this is a setup that I really like. I think analog dials feel a little bit classier. Though that central display doesn't really ever tell you all that much, it's nice, bright, clear, easy to read. The car is fairly easy to place. It feels nice and small on these tight, narrow little British B roads, and it's a generally fairly pleasant thing to drive. There are two flavours of the MX-30, and each has three trim levels available. So the regular MX-30 EV starts at £31,250, and that is for the entry-level prime line trim. Then, for about £1,900 more, you can have the exclusive line, and then for about £2,000 more, so thirty-five and a half, you can get the top-of-the-line MX-30 Makoto. This, then, is the MX-30 REV. And the R is what's likely got people interested, because it stands for Rotary. Yep, that's right, it's not just the doors that hark back to the old RX-8, because under that bonnet you'll also find a single rotor 830cc version of the old Mazda favourite, the Rotary engine. 
just in case you're somehow unfamiliar with exactly what a rotary engine is, well, in a regular engine you have a piston that moves up and down, and in a rotor you have what is vaguely a triangle that spins. You want to know more? Ask other people that are far, far more knowledgeable than I. The rotary engine is something Mazda were a big proponent of for a number of decades. However, it eventually got killed off about 15 years ago because, simply put, it could no longer meet the then ever-tightening emissions regulations. And the fact was, rotary engines were always a tricky so-and-so. Without forced induction, they don't really make all that much torque, they have to rev fairly high to make the power that they do, and they aren't particularly fuel efficient. They also had reliability issues, particularly later on, and generally speaking, it was kind of hard to persuade people why exactly they would want one over anything else. The chief benefit of the rotary in many cases was the fact that, technically speaking, because of the way they measured it, you got a lot of power from what was a relatively small engine. Case in point, the old RX-8, despite being a naturally aspirated 1.3, developed 230 horsepower. Sadly, it drank like a V8 that made 500 horsepower, you had to constantly throw oil at the thing, and eventually the engine would fail. Though rebuilding a rotary is actually a fairly simple task, nobody on this green earth I think believes that an engine rebuild should be almost a maintenance item. And so as far as many people were concerned, the rotary 15 or so years ago was going to be consigned to the history bin once and for all. Now though, it's back. And actually, this is one of the many things that I think made this car on paper quite so clever. You see, the rotary has many, many flaws, but one of its strengths is that it's very compact and lightweight. And that's why Mazda chose to use it here. Because, you see, the regular MX-30 EV is a plain, pure BEV. In other words, a full electric car with no other sort of power being generated. Everything comes from the battery and the electric motors. This, though, is what you'd term a range extender. In other words, the car is still driven purely by the electric motor, meaning that when you put your foot down, you get that nice, smooth power delivery of a full electric car. However, when you then run out of battery power, the motor kicks in and works like a generator, keeping the battery topped up. Mazda certainly didn't invent this concept, and it has been about for quite some time. However, here, I thought it was actually really going to work. But sadly, that's just not the case. And that's a real shame because from behind the wheel, I actually really like this car. The REV makes marginally more power than the regular EV, 170 horses here versus 145 there, which means that it's not really quick, but it's quick enough for daily duty. It's also fairly refined, and I love the suspension setup here. The last two new Mazdas that I drove, I criticised for being overly harsh. They were very crashy things and slightly unpleasant along some of my favourite roads, and that really was a shame. This, though, is wonderfully set up, and I think would really appeal to those who enjoy the Richard Parry Jones era of Fords. So there's still an element of firmness to it, but also suppleness. And I would say that of all the new Mazdas I've driven, MX-5 aside, this is by far the best damped. The steering also has a nice keenness about it, it's very quick to turn in. The whole thing feels fairly agile. This might be helped by the fact that curb weight here is only around 1.7 to 1.8 tonnes, which, though yes a lot for a small car, is still relatively low for an electric one. This again is part of the benefit of having the rotary setup. Though I should point out, the REV is about 150 kilos heavier than the regular non-extender EV. How's the turning circle? Well, let's find out. Well, it's pretty good, actually. It's not spectacular, but it's decent. You have, with this top-of-the-line car, 360-degree cameras, you've got parking sensors, heads-up display, both stereo, comfy enough seats. It's, it all seems to get off to a fairly good start. But there are a few fundamental issues that I simply cannot ignore. 
trying to work out a fuel economy equivalent for a car like this, a plug-in hybrid, is difficult. Because you're actually burning essentially two fuels at the same time. You have your petrol and you have your electricity. Now the fact is that in the entire time I've had this car, I've barely even sipped from the fuel tank. The car's used maybe about 5 or 10% of what it was delivered with. However, when the car arrived, the electric battery was completely depleted. Now this shouldn't be the case. This is not how press cars are meant to be delivered and this is an omission, this is an error, and Mazda have apologised to me profusely for it. Unfortunately, what this did was reveal a couple of issues. First off, if the battery has got itself into such a state, though the car will still happily run and drive, it will do so with reduced performance. And you even get a little yellow tortoise on the dash here to tell you that the car isn't going to be quite as quick as it normally would. It's not quite like driving something in limp home mode, but it's uh, not entirely far off either. As with just about all plug-in hybrids, the way this car has been set up is to try and leverage as much of that electric power as it can before it then has to go and use some of the petrol, which is absolutely fine. However, it does mean if you're constantly topping the thing up, as I have been this week, it can mislead you. And this early experience did at least get to show me what happens when you have finally depleted the battery. And the results are not good. First off, you have the already mentioned reduced performance. Secondly, you'll then be joined by the noise of a distant rotary engine that's evidently been muffled as best as Mazda can, but it's not really a very pleasant companion. Just sits there going and as you put your foot down, very CVT-like and um, not particularly appealing. Anybody that thought this was ever going to sound like an old RX-8 or heaven forbid 7 was um, I think always going to be disappointed. But you see neither of those things I think could really be classified as a deal breaker. Instead what could and should is the economy you then get when the car has to rely on its range extender capability. You see when this car was delivered to me it was reporting an average fuel economy of 28.5 to the gallon. Over the last week, I have been able to improve that somewhat, but now it is currently sat at 31.4, which is not good. The electric economy has happily been somewhat better, the car averaging around about 3 miles per kilowatt hour, which for the depth of winter is not all that bad. However, I hate to tell you this, but it does get even worse. You see, the battery pack in the regular MX-30 EV is, I think, far, far too small. At just under 35 kilowatt hours, it provides a range that even according to Mazda themselves will be at best around 124 miles. And many have reported in the real world translates actually to about 100 miles. My original thinking was that if this car essentially gave you that, plus range extender capability, it would be perfect. But it doesn't. And it's not. You see, the REV in fact has a battery pack of under half that capacity and gives you, at this time of year, fully charged an all-electric range of only about 36 miles. In absolute best case scenario, only just about 50 miles. And in fact, even if you run through the entire petrol tank, which is actually a fairly generous size, 50 litres, you've got a range of just about 200 to 220 miles which is frankly pathetic. And this leaves the MX-30 in a rather awkward position. You see, the whole theory behind a car like this is that it's got just enough electric range that for the vast majority of your regular usage, you don't even need to involve the petrol engine at all. But then, if you do want to go up to Scotland, you can do so just as though you were driving a regular petrol car. It is, on paper, the best of both worlds. But for me, in practice, it is in fact the worst of both worlds, because you have here an electric range that is so small, I think the vast majority of people would probably want something a little bit more. And if, say, for example, 30 to 40 miles a day usage is enough for you, and you can charge easily and on a regular basis, why wouldn't you just go and buy a full electric car? Even the regular MX-30 EV, you get double the range, therefore you've got to worry half as often. 
Then, if you are going to do regular long journeys, the fuel economy of this is absolutely awful. You may as well just go and buy a regular Mazda 3. It will work out significantly better. It's just a deeply, deeply flawed car, this. Even those doors, I thought they were a fabulous idea. When I told my sister I was getting this car and I said, oh, it's got these great, amazing doors, she said, oh, they're rubbish. She's got two small kids, you see, and tells me that though you think they're going to be a good idea for those with kids, actually, they're not. And she's right. You see, I did a little experiment in a car park where I tried to see if I could get in the back seat of this car. And I couldn't. As it is, even in perfect conditions, with absolutely nothing around the car, getting in the back here is a squeeze. I've got short little legs too, and I can just about get in the back, but it's not a nice place to be. If you've then got stuff around you, as you of course will in a car park, the way that door at the back then works, you just don't really have enough room to be able to open it far enough that you can actually get anything in or out. Even children, I think, would struggle. And as Michelle rightly pointed out, once you've uh, got the door open, you then need to sort of get the child to sort of come forwards to be able to then close the door, to close the other door. It's all very, very awkward. And this is a shame because I really, really want to like this car, but I can't. I do also sadly have a few other gripes. Though this main display up here is controlled by a nice, sensible and logical physical setup down here, the HVAC, for some reason, and Mazda don't really do this, is now a touchscreen with a few buttons either side to control your basic functions, but that didn't need to be a screen. More annoyingly, perhaps because it's winter, most of the time it's been defaulting to its night setting, where it's so dim you can barely read it. In terms of ADAS, the car has all the ones you would expect, and though the lane departure system has actually been refreshingly unintrusive, the forward and reverse warnings have been the opposite. There's been a couple of times where the car's been absolutely certain I'm about to have an accident and it's applied the brakes, including last night when I was reversing onto my own driveway and it thought I was going to hit something or other, I don't know, an errant leaf, and it, um, well, nearly broke my neck, the damn thing. The boot is also of an okay size, neither great nor poor, and likely in line with many other cars of this shape, but honestly, this is in the category of what I would call, you should have bought a Golf, or here, a Mazda 3, because that's effectively the same size, if not slightly smaller, and feels quite a bit roomier. And the most damning thing I can say about the MX-30 is that, as a motoring journalist, you're always trying to think of all of the other people out there that might want to buy a car. Very often you'll drive something and go, yeah, it's lovely, but it's not for me. However, oh, my brother-in-law, he'd go nuts for this. The MX-30, though, I can't think of a single person for whom this would actually make any sense above and beyond anything else. As an EV, it appears to be good value, up until the point that you realise the range is so small, honestly, nobody's going to buy it. And in fact, I believe in the USA, it's already been discontinued. I wouldn't be shocked if here in Europe, it's not far behind. Were they to combine the larger battery pack with that rotary range extender, then, and only then, it might just about make sense, and the relatively poor economy of the rotary engine might be less of a concern, because you're just going to need it far less of the time. But as it is, the MX-30 REV gets a big thumbs down from me. Anyway, I want to say thanks to everybody for watching, and as ever, to Mazda for lending me this car. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one.